Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Nancy Burnett from the Board of Deacons. We welcome you to our service this morning on Earth Sunday. We're very lucky today to have Reverend Cynthia Davidson, the Executive Director of Interfaith Power and Light, joining us this morning. Reverend Davidson believes in the restorative power of nature and in the creative potential of people of faith working together for environmental and climate justice. So, welcome. Um, the flowers in the window and back on the coffee table are from Connie Burr's funeral yesterday, so we wanted to feel like we had a little bit of Connie with us this morning. Um, there are blue prayer cards in your pews and also on the table in back if you have any prayer requests. Name tab tags are back and all are invited to wear their name tags. There's a sign-up sheet if you need a new one at the Welcome Center. Um, Janet Trippy is our welcomer this morning if anybody has any questions. Um, the training choir is meeting for rehearsal this morning at 1045. And Deb is looking for another person for the Sunday school this morning just to go downstairs and sit. You really don't have to do anything. She just needs a second person. So if anybody can do that, just go down when the kids leave. Um, and Kathy and Jean both have announcements. Good morning. I just wanted to thank everyone who donated to the Easter uh, collection for Ukraine last week at both of our Easter services. Through your generosity, we collected more than $1,700. Yeah, pretty nice. Um, which was forwarded to the First Church in Marlboro, which will in turn go to Poland to help with the um, Ukrainian um, refugee relief effort there. So blessings to you all. Thank you. I just want to invite all the members to, that are here today to stay afterwards for um, the special congregational meeting at 11. So after the service, go get a cup of coffee, and then uh, we'll be checking members into the con uh, back into the meeting. The meeting will be here in the sanctuary, and we'll be voting on two things today. One is changes to our bylaws that requires a two-thirds vote, so hence we need an accurate count of members. And the second thing will be consideration of a capital campaign. So I hope you can, all the members can join us today. Thank you, and please join us for coffee and refreshments after the service. Thank you. Good morning. Please join me in the opening call to worship. How wonderful are the works of God. God made all living things, animals, plants, and humans, and calls us to care for and protect them all. God equips and empowers us to live as good stewards. Please join in our opening hymn in your new century hymnal number seven, All People That On Earth Do Dwell.
We rejoice in all life. We live in all things. All things live in us. We live by the sun, move with the stars. We eat from the earth, we drink from the rain, we breathe from the air. We share with the creatures, we have strength through their gifts. We depend on the forest. We have knowledge through their secrets. We have the privilege of seeing and understanding. We have the responsibility of caring. We have the joy of celebrating. We are full of the grace of creation. We are graceful. We are grateful. We rejoice. Now join me in a prayer of sorrow and confession. We have forgotten who we are. We have alienated ourselves from the unfolding of the cosmos. We have become strange from the of the earth. We have turned our backs on the life. We have sought only our own security. We have exploited simply for our own ends. We have distorted our knowledge. We have abused our power. Now the forests are dying, and the creatures are disappearing, and the humans are despairing. We ask forgiveness. We ask for the gift of remembering. We ask for the strength to change.
Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. Thank you to the music director. So it seems that we have very few children under the age of, let's say, 40 or 50 in the congregation today. And as we are all children of God, and so we don't make the few children here feel uncomfortable up front, we'll just have a time for all ages, as we do in my Unitarian Universalist tradition. Come forward. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. So, do you like flags? Maybe you have some flags in your home, your favorite sports team. Here's one I like. It's actually made in the USA, right? The flag of our earth, right? Which is the theme of today's worship service, and that's what it looks like if we were on a spaceship. But I want to talk about what it looks like in our own lives, with our feet on the ground here. And so I wonder, I wonder if you like to sit outside. Do you like to play outside in the grass or in the trees? Pick dandelions and wait until they get all white and fluffy and blow them? Or maybe do other things, find sticks and rocks and stones and all kinds of interesting things, right? So I invite you all to think about what it is that you like about the out of doors. Perhaps you have a special place. Do you have a special place that you go to in your yard or in a park or outside on the schoolyard? Or you might sit and watch the world go by, or at least a few birds or worms. We have a very famous poem in the, in the uh, Psalms, number 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And then it goes on. But those are the pieces that I want to talk about. What does it feel like to be somewhere? Maybe you're sitting outside on the green in the summertime services and feel your soul restored. Feel nature and creation holding you. This is an important practice for many people, communing with nature and appreciating God's wonder of creation. There is another poet that I like, a Christian man by the name of Wendell Berry. Many of you may know his writings. A farmer, a poet, deeply, deeply connected to the land. And he has a particular poem that talks about what he does when he is sad or worried about things. And he goes, and as he puts it, he lies down where the wood drake, a type of a duck, bird, rest in his beauty on the water. And the great heron, that's one of those birds with the long legs and really long neck that dips down to get the fish, where it feeds. And he comes into the piece of what he called wild things, meaning the animals, the creatures. And he comes into the presence of the still water and he knows that up above him are the stars, although they can't see them in the daytime. They only can, we can only see them at night. And for a time as he is resting there, he feels free. He feels relieved. He feels refreshed. And his soul is restored. And so what I want to leave you with is when you have those moments of despair, Maybe you had a fight with someone or they said something that hurt you. And your instinct is to run outside and go sit under the tree and pout a bit. Well, maybe that's the time when your soul will be restored and you will feel free from those burdens and worries. May it be so. Thank you for joining.
The first scripture reading for today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and every other creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Today's second reading is from the book of Psalm, chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world, and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? And it was good. Throughout the creation story in the book of Genesis, we read after each act of creation, God saw that it was good. After humankind was created and blessed by God, indeed, it was very good. Is humankind still good? Are we living up to God's charge to be faithful stewards of creation? 
Certainly we do well in rejoicing in all life and the beauty of this earth. We do well in celebrating the web of life day after day in our many and various ways. Friday marked the 52nd anniversary of the founding of Earth Day in the United States. 50 years ago, approximately 10% of the American population, representing people of all persuasions and ages, came together across the country for teachings and rallies and acts of service, tree plantings and other environmentally consciousness raising activities. And from this great outpouring and public demand came, of course, the founding of the Environmental Protection Agency and the passage of the Clean Air Act. These were followed shortly thereafter by the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. We seemed so well poised to right the wrongs of decades, if not centuries, of environmental degradation and devastation. We seem so well poised then to truly honor, protect, and preserve the health of creation. Since then, we've seen the threat of climate change slowly but surely materialize and the impacts escalating on a scale perhaps not fully anticipated some 50 years ago. Rising sea levels, increased flooding and drought, crop failures, worsening air quality, severe, unpredictable, severe weather events. If we are not personally experiencing one or more of these impacts, we certainly are witnessing them if we are keeping up with the news. To read the latest report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, it's a very sobering experience, to say the least. The latest report from the working group recently writes that the next few years offer a narrow window to realize a sustainable, livable future for all. Change in course will require immediate and ambitious and concerted efforts to slash carbon emissions, build resilience, there's a movement to make congregations and churches hubs of resilience in their community. There's a need to conserve ecosystems. And of course, there's always money involved, right? Redirecting funds to adaptation and people and institutions sustaining loss and damage. That's sobering, it's daunting, it's so massive, it's what we call a wicked problem. It is so complex. It's overwhelming, and it issues a call to action. Now, I know that there are some who continue deny, to deny that climate change is a reality and claim that it's a hoax. I have members of my own family in that camp. So I want to share with you this TLDR version. Oh, TLDR stands for too long, don't read, or too long, didn't read, and it's an abbreviation often used in emails or social media posts where someone just wants to cut to the message and then put the whole document below. So this particular TLDR version is from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. It's concise, very direct, very, very clear on the state of our planetary crisis. So if you're in a bind sometime, you might want to have this in your back pocket as a tool. Five facts, 10 words that simplify the scientific complexity of climate change. It's real, it's us, it's bad, scientists agree, there's hope. It's real, it's us, science, it's bad, Scientists agree there is hope. Yes, we are in for a bumpy ride together for the foreseeable future, and even more so for those on the real front lines of climate change, the most vulnerable among us and our children and grandchildren and all those yet to come. 
So, in this context, what does it mean to be a faithful steward of creation? In our scripture reading from Genesis, God tells humankind two things. First, to subdue the earth. And second, to have dominion over the creatures. To subdue, to care for, to nurture, and to subdue all that threatens the flourishing of life. I wonder, could it be that today we are called to subdue the fossil fuel industry and the way it has ravaged our landscapes? Subdue the carbon emissions outpouring into our atmosphere. Subdue the sacrificing of land and lives and livelihoods and cultures of people living where extraction has taken place and continues to take place. Those mining towns, those fracking sites on indigenous lands and reservations. Secondly, we are charged with exercising dominion over the creatures. This is a passage that is so often poorly interpreted as as a God-given right to dominate. Dominion is not domination. In fact, it is a responsibility to use our divinely endowed capacities to reign, if you will, with reason and kindness and compassion and wisdom to be the benevolent ruler, so to speak all for looking out for the best interest of all of the kingdom, all of the kingdom of God. What does it mean to exercise stewardship in a faithful way? I would suggest to you that this becomes something you contemplate, each one of you, in your own ways, in your hearts, in your prayers, in your journals if you write, And that you consider this question in your conversations with others in the congregation, in the communities where you live, and in your circles of friends, family, and colleagues. Make this a piece of your own holy devotional work and spiritual practice. Ponder this in your heart. What does it mean for me and others to be faithful stewards? It is important to recognize that we are not distinct from nature, but created as a part of nature and the cosmos. We need to leave behind the concept of a duality of man and nature, man versus nature, and realize that we are but a part of a vast interdependent web of life. What we do to the planet, we in fact do to ourselves and we ignore this reality to our own peril, both physically and spiritually. We need to affirm and rest assured of our creative place in the community of creatures, not be isolated or divorced from it. And we must disavow ourselves of that notion that God's will is for mankind to exploit and dominate nature for our own profit. So let us be faithful stewards by living in harmony with the natural world, respecting the natural limits and bounds. This is something that has been well articulated and practiced by many of our indigenous kin for creatures and for centuries, and we would do well to heed their wisdom and advice. Now, as you gathered from my story, I do strongly believe that to be a faithful steward, it helps to develop our relationship with nature in in whatever ways appeal to you and fit your life. If you have a spiritual practice, take it outdoors, sitting or walking meditation, contemplating the beauty of the earth, writing in your journal outdoors. Perhaps you're the type that like to till the earth and garden, hands in the dirt. In engaging in other nature-based practices and climate solutions, like supporting conservation or rewilding 
and reforestation efforts that actually help prevent biodiversity loss and increase our carbon sinks. We must vow, however, to leave no creature behind, nor any living thing. Neither, as the, as the uh, text in Genesis tells us, neither the fish of the sea nor the birds of the air, nor the other living creatures that move upon the earth. Neither the vegetation, plants yielding seed, nor the fruit trees of every kind. Being a faithful steward of God's creation in our time does carry an additional and heavy responsibility, which is to create environmental and climate justice. This means that we center justice making not simply focus on climate solutions, but to center on justice making and climate planning and mitigation and adaptation efforts. Focusing on equity and inclusion and privileging those who are most impacted by climate change. Making sure there are seats at the table for the leaders from those communities most impacted and showing up as allies to flank that leadership since those leaders know best what is needed in their community. No swooping in as outside experts. We must mend the web of life and society by stitching together strong, strong collaborative relationships. Right, relationships. Relationships that take time and effort to develop. Now, most importantly, as faithful stewards, I believe it behooves us to shun and break climate silence. We must learn to get comfortable speaking truths about climate change and bringing the convictions of our faith into the public square and into the conversations that we have with our friends and colleagues who might not share our views. That might be uncomfortable, but you can do it, I'm sure. Telling the truth about climate change means saying that it is happening more quickly than expected. Telling the truth about climate change means saying there will be increased suffering ahead, disproportionately impacting those on those small islands and in coastal villages, but also the most vulnerable and marginalized in our own cities and state and country. The elderly, the young, the poor, the uninsured or underinsured who suffer the most from heat, cold, and respiratory distress. Telling the truth about climate change means saying that it's about much more than light bulbs, cars, and dinner plates. And believe me, I could spend hours talking about light bulbs, cars, and dinner plates. But we need to acknowledge the link to our deep history as an extractive capitalist economy with unsustainable notions of unlimited growth and expansion. We have to acknowledge that in order to chart a new path forward. Telling the truth about climate change means saying that the melting of ice shelves and the permafrost is unstoppable and that the sea level rise projections will exceed the data that was used to negotiate the Paris Climate Accord. And so that means that as we are telling the truth about climate change, it means that we have to do better than that Paris Agreement, even with its flaws, and do it more quickly. That's a daunting task. And sadly, it also means that confessing that we confess that as a society at large, we have failed to take timely action. But we must not fail to take responsibility for the especially heavy burden that climate change places on our young people and future generations. But the good news is that telling our truth about climate change helps free us to move forward with a larger imagination. We can't do that if we're in denial. And I hope that it help bring us together as a society. 
So I invite you to make a pledge. Silently on your heart, talk with someone, make an actual pledge, promise. Pledge to have at least one conversation a day about some aspect of climate change. Not to remain silent, not to just ruminate in your mind or despair over the latest headline, but to take the next step and reach outward and connect with someone. To engage in a thoughtful discussion, whether that's in person or by phone, sending a quick email, forwarding an article, hey, what do you think about this, just worries me. Open the discussion and practice empathy and truth telling. I encourage you to tell your story, share your observations, we know that personal stories are often more compelling than facts. Here's one of mine that I want to share with you. It was autumn in the late 1980s. I was much younger, mother with children. And I was driving from North Carolina to Western Pennsylvania to my hometown. And I was on the Blue Ridge Parkway. I was anticipating one of those picture-perfect scenic drives, just like all the postcards and the photos you see in magazines. And I was unprepared for the reality of seeing instead a vast landscape of dead and dying trees at the tree line, as far as I could see. It was stark and devastating. It looked like a black and white photo. And it delivered a real punch to my gut. Even today, I can recall the visceral impact of this firsthand encounter with acid rain. I'd known about it, but I'd never seen or witnessed it. Here, I could see the very real impact of the coal-burning plant miles upwind near, in Pennsylvania, near where I grew up, which has spewed the toxins into the air that were now raining down on lands and waterways miles away. I remember just being in despair, having to pull over. Is there nowhere out of reach, I wondered? Nowhere really pristine? Oh my God, what are we doing? That particular experience is small, not particularly noteworthy, but it impacted me. But that experience and the embodied memory has stayed with me far beyond the memory of any set of words or any sermon I ever heard, any newspaper article I've read, any documentary I ever saw, and even the compiled collective re writings of my favorite author, Bill McKibben. None of them have had that same impact as that visual experience. I have not been able to unsee that, nor disregard the realization it has brought since. And I can, have not been able to ignore how that had compelled me to take action. I imagine each one of us, each of you, has had some kind of a similar aha moment in your lifetime. Might not be as dramatic as a vast landscape. Maybe it's more subtle, like something you're noticing up close. What have you noticed about the changes in your favored landscapes or sacred places of repose? What have you noticed about the loss of biodiversity? What are you noticing about climate change? So I invite you to join me in making it a practice to stay open, be aware, pay attention, and notice whatever it is you're noticing, and that you grieve as climate change advances. And rather than pushing that away or intellectualizing it or rationalizing it, take it in and feel it deeply and grieve it. We need to be comfortable with letting that into our lives. Learn to see the truth of what we as people have done knowingly or unknowingly. And let us bring these into our lives and into practices, regular ongoing practices of confession, 
Let us ask for forgiveness that we know we are assured by God's love and commit ourselves to being more faithful stewards. My friends, we are in this together. And so I invite you to join me and legions of others in truly loving this earth and all her beings and deeply questioning our ways. This is how we honor God's creation. We are all called to mend the web of life and to support Earth's regenerative forces. Massachusetts Interfaith Power and Light, which I serve as the executive director, has a long history of helping congregations take action to reduce their carbon emissions through energy saving measures and getting off fossil fuels in a step-by-step -step fashion. Typically moving from oil to gas to electrification and renewable energy when possible. And also involving members and asking them to do the same in their homes and any property they own. This has been our signature work in the last two decades, as our name indicates. However, we know that reducing our carbon footprint, no matter how impressive and necessary that is, will not be sufficient for addressing today's climate urgency. And what is needed is a massive awakening and movement, with citizens demanding that their legislators and decision makers get with it and do better at the local, state, and federal levels. To that end, Mass IPL is piloting its Faith Action Network for Climate and Environmental Justice. It's a program we abbreviate as FAN, F-A-N, Faith Action Network. And the aim is to mobilize multi-faith teams of constituents by legislative districts and to empower them to build ongoing relationships with their legislators and other decision makers and hold them accountable for their votes on climate-friendly legislation and follow up with them afterwards. You can learn more about this if it interests you by visiting our website, massipl.org. If you click on Mobilize, there's an interest form you can fill out if you're interested in exploring this possibility here in your own community. Mass IPL is funded by congregational memberships and individual donors, and we thank you for your support and interest in joining us. I am happy to speak with you afterwards if you're, learning, if you're interested in learning more about what we do, although I do understand you have an important congregational meeting this, today. So do reach out by the website or pick up one of my cards on the way out. Friends, we are all called to be faithful stewards and agents of co-creation held in God's love. Let that love that never ends and the companionship of your gathered community be a source of strength and give you the resolve to do what we know is right, to mend the web of life and guard well its future. We have long been given the commandment to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love one another as ourselves. And it has been said that as Christians, we will be known by your love. I do believe that leading with love is the only way forward in these especially challenging times when so much is at stake. May we remember to extend love, compassion, and forgiveness to one another and ourselves when the tensions are high and the pressure is on. May we extend our love to the most needy. That means the endangered species as well as the poor, the children and the young people of the world, and to our neighbors near and far on the front lines of, community, of, of climate change those struggling with rising sea levels or battling resource extraction on their sacred lands, or maybe finding themselves on the short end of the stick in the transition to a clean energy economy. 
Above all, may we practice and embody a love for this earth and all her being that never ends. For creation is indeed an essential part of our faith, and we honor God's trust in us when we uphold the sacredness of nature. I pray it may always be so. Amen. Please join me in your prayer for Ukraine, printed in your order of service. Loving God, we pray for the people of Ukraine, for all those suffering or afraid, that you will be close to them and protect them. We pray for world leaders, for compassion, strength, and wisdom to guide their choices. We pray for the world that in this moment of crisis, we may reach out in solidarity to our brothers and sisters in need. May we walk in your ways so that peace and justice become a reality for the people of Ukraine and for all the world. This is a time in our service when we lift up our joys and concerns we have in our prayer request, prayers requested for the Correa family on the passing of Jackie. In our other prayers, we pray for the families of Connie, Bill, Bill, six-year-old Bryce, Kristen, Dalton, Tripp, and Cam. We pray for Anne, Bonnie, Wendy, and Tom. We hold in our hearts Lisa, Owen, Nolan, Anna, Chris, and Bill. We hold in our hearts Florence, Dot, and Chiara. Are there other joys or sorrows which you would like to lift up at this time? Okay, I can't see very well. <laughs> the lady, somebody there has their hand up. Yes. They can, I can't. <laughs> We hold all these prayers and concerns in our heart. Surround them with love. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive us our trespasses, 
we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The offering to sustain the life and ministry of the congregation will now be gratefully received. Creator, you have blessed us with abundant good. May these gladly given gifts support the life and mission of this church, helping see the recreation we need to see in this world. And may the gifts and works of our minds, hearts, and hands do the same. Um, I know you wanted to sing that, right? Yeah. This is the day that we have been given. Rejoice in it. Go in peace. Tread lightly on the earth. Practice love. Amen.